This time on the show, comics for music lovers, comics for the recovering goth, and Alf Saves Christmas. All this and more on Comics Are Great. It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live Wednesdays at the Ann Arbor District Library in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, comics.aadl.org. And this is the show where we talk about making comics, writing comics, drawing comics, the lifestyle of the cartoonist, all the stuff that surrounds this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today, it's the end of the year. It's the last show of the year. And continuing our tradition, we've brought back, well, I'm grateful to be joined by uh, the Comics Bakery team, Raina Telgemeier and Dave Roman. Hey, guys. Hey, Jersey. Happy holidays. Hey, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and so on. Comics Bakery, we never really plug, uh, play up the Comics Bakery thing, but that's like your guys' business, right? It's become our business. Um, at one point, it was sort of just like a name that we used for tabling at conventions. Um, but then at a certain point, Raina and I had to incorporate and take our business seriously for tax <laughs> purposes. Um, and we spent like over a year trying to think of a better name <laughs> or a new name and they're just, it, we just couldn't do it and we were just putting it off and our accountant was getting annoyed with us so we were just like, uh, the comics bakery <laughs> uh, and we just started to make sure that our, our friends that we were sharing tables with were okay with that and hopefully they are. <laughs> For those who are new to the show, it's comicsbakery.com and that's where you can find the work of Raina Telgemeier of uh, Smile, Drama, uh, Sisters, The Babysitter's Club which is coming out in color next year. That's right. That's Starting awesome. in April. That's exciting. Uh, and then Dave Roman of uh, Astronaut Academy and Starbunny.net. Teen Boat. Teen Boat with John Green, who was on the last episode. So, That's right. And, and you guys went the, the distance and did a special holiday background for this holiday special. For, right. the, for those who are listening to the audio, you should watch the video because Dave drew a special fireplace <laughs> behind them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since it's a holiday special we have to have our cozy uh setting so i i drew a fireplace with a mantle uh with some family and friends on the mantle um and i made sure that we had some sound effects because it's a it's a comics fireplace after all so there's some crackly <laughs> uh sound effects and some presents which are filled with comics of course Perhaps the comics that we'll talk about on the show today. Probably. Uh, so awesome to have you guys back. And I should say that uh, just just for the people who are tuning in for the first time, you guys, this is the, the, going on our fourth year now of doing this. Uh, it was Comics Are Great, episode 42 was the first uh, end of the year episode with Raina. Then we did episode 69 with, with Raina. And then uh, episode 91 last year. So... Uh, I, I hope this uh, tradition continues. So thank you guys. And then also in studio, we have Androsed, no relation. Hello. <laughs> Androsed at the Ann Arbor District Library. Actually, we are related, I we guess. Are. You By are law. my spouse. Yes. Yes. Okay. So full disclosure, we're married. <laughs> and I also work at the Ann Arbor District Library. Yes. Yes. As? The librarian. Uh, your production librarian. Isn't that the official title? Yes. What does that mean? It means that I work in IT and I get to do all sorts of fantastic things to support all of the wonderful projects that happen here at the library, including ordering books, doing programming, getting events to happen. I'm working on tools collections. Can we talk about the tools collection just for a second? Because th that just got rolled out last weekend at Tiny Expo. Well, no, the tools collection has been well, no, a but thing the art while, tools but collection. We are starting to roll out more art tools. So, like what? Oh, I can get a paintbrush at the library? That's no, dumb. No, we are trying to get things in people's hands that they wouldn't necessarily try out, like a paintbrush, which has a very low cost for you to get involved in, in painting. You go you can spend like a couple bucks and get a paintbrush. Uh, we have Wacom tablets. So there are now graphics tablets if people want to get into digital art. Um, yarn swifts and ball winders. Um, Spinning wheels, right? Soon to be coming, spinning oh. mills, sewing machines, a bunch sewing of machines. really exciting. Things I could check out a sewing machine at the library. About yes, that is really cool, and I could check out Wacom tablets at the library. Yes, you can. 
That's amazing. And I mean, you got like all sizes. Like you got like a, like a mammoth one yes, that you can check out. Yes, we have the Intuos Pro, which is really large and was a little bit too much for <laughs> me to handle. I'm used to drawing on a small surface. So yeah. it was kind of overwhelming when I tried it out to be like, I have all this space that I can draw on. Yeah. So <laughs> it was really cool to try out though. And I think that I could get used to drawing on something that large. Could you? Yes, uh, I, I, could. I It was hurting my shoulder working that big. But but the, 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 it's. I just think it's amazing that we live in a time where your library lends out professional art tools to the public that is so cool and it's so cool that you get to be a part of that yeah it's very exciting. and we should say you're the selector of comics for the library now i am selecting comics which i am very thrilled to be doing yeah wow so <laughs> yes. that, that's 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 a lot of power to wield so and uh it's a great responsibility <laughs> yes <laughs> i could be not ordering something that the community really needs to have so but you're yes. also like so conscientious because my my hands went like this when i found out that you were the comic selector but i don't have any special privileges in that no, regard you do no not. I don't know. Nope. it's a bummer <laughs> okay well we're supposed to talk about comics for the holidays and so i assembled a, a crack team to talk about um it's the it's middle of December at the time of this live stream, so you may be wondering like this is like we're kind of like in like the real last minute shopping kind of time period. As a matter of fact, Raina, today's the last day to order signed copies of your books, right? From the story yeah. bookshop. Um the local indie bookstore that I work with in my neighborhood has graciously been able to um, allow people to order books through their website. And they'll ship them anywhere in the world. And today is the last day for domestic orders. So the bookstore is called the Astoria Bookshop. Their website is astoriabooks.com. <laughs> and if you want to go right to the Raina Telgemeier page, it's astoriabooks.com. Wait, Astoria Books or Astoria Bookshop? Sorry, <laughs> astoriabookshop.com slash Raina, R-A-I-N-A. Um, and I'll go and sign them for you tomorrow, and then you'll get them in time for Christmas. Oh, wow. You're going to sign them, like, day of shipping. Oh wow! Yeah, we're we're doing things uh, on the ball over here. After you did tens of thousands of autographs on all those special books for Black Friday that went out. Oh my gosh! <laughs> it was fifty five hundred. But oh, oh my! Wow. <laughs> <laughs> on top of all the books you signed while on tour. Yeah. <laughs> 2014's been a, an, it's been a year. <laughs> yeah, I bet it has. I bet we could do a whole episode just on like your year in review. Um, but oh, you could also find uh, the 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 post about where to get the books at goreina.com. Mm -hmm. That's one of the top posts on there. Um, okay, so yeah, uh, this is the time where it's like, okay, I got to get something for somebody. I don't know what to buy, and then also, um, you know, maybe, maybe, just maybe, you want to buy some comics for somebody for the holiday season. So we've all got a big pile of books to uh, talk up to say, like, this is who it's for. Uh, this is why you should get it. This is why the story is interesting. This is why the book stands apart. Who wants to start? Who wants to go first? I'm happy to. Okay, please. <laughs> All right. So um, a book that came out in September that I'm very, very fond of is Tomboy by Liz Prince. And this is Liz's autobiographical story of growing up as a tomboy in a world that doesn't really know what to do with people that fall outside of the totally standard gender norms. And Liz is amazing because she is from a really early age just sort of identified simply as herself and this book goes up till the point where she where she's in high school and you know she does things like try out for the baseball team and then have to stop playing baseball because um, <laughs> puberty doesn't really jive with certain aspects of that and then you know just like having to wear dresses and, and a, a skirt at Catholic school and um, her crushes on boys, which people don't quite understand because they're like, but you're a tomboy. You must also be a lesbian. Um, mm. So this is this is a really honest and touching book about someone who really knows who they are. And I want to say that it's a good book for readers who have read Smile and have sort of grown into like the high school years. And... Um, it's not perfect for readers of Smile because there is some more mature content in it. There is some swearing and some smoking and some, you know, just discussion of, of sexuality and gender. But um, for high schoolers, I think it's a fantastic, fantastic read. So that's my first recommendation. And it's published by Zest Books. Hmm. So um, you can find this 
hopefully in most bookstores, and it's gotten onto some of the best of the year lists, and I really, really love it. It's really awesome. So Tomboy by... Liz Prince. Liz Prince. She goes by Comic Nerd on uh, Twitter. And that's nerd without an E in it. It's N-R-R-D. N-R-R-D. I mean, I, it would seem like those kind of themes would be appropriate for a lot of high schoolers. Uh, mm-hmm. they're, they're, that's the age where you're getting exposed to that kind of stuff. You're, it, even, even if you're not participating in that kind of stuff, there's you see kids doing stuff like that. Like there's Tobacco shows up when you're in high school, I, depending on what high school you go to, right? Tobacco didn't show up at my high school at all. Oh, uh, well... <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was that was the qualifier that I threw in there. But like even at the school Anne and I went to, when we were kids. Like there was like the cool kid in the leather jacket who sat out in the atrium at lunch and like just defiantly lit up. Right? We didn't yes. emulate his behavior, but <laughs> but they they were there. They were there. Yeah, there were a lot of them. So, but yes, I guess you do have to throw out those disclaimers, Raina, just because the the, the age we live in and uh, this country is very diverse. Dave, do you have a pick? Um, well, speaking of a diverse world, uh, some of my choices are sort of playing to the uh, we, need, we Need Diverse Books uh, theme, which was a sort of a big, uh, got a lot of push this year, I guess, a lot of people sort of talking about the need for diverse uh, diversity in books of all ranges, but uh, comics is a good place. And I'm going to start with a Marvel comic, because most of the time we talk about indie books, and I'm always pushing kids' comics and uh, the sort of indie self-published stuff or small press. Um, but Marvel's actually been doing some really amazing things. For I mean, they've always have, but... Um, Ms. Marvel. Like in the past couple of years. Um, so this one book in particular we'll talk about is called Miss Marvel. Um, and I heard a lot of people talking about this um, specifically because I th- it it was a it sort of plays to this typical Marvel comics teen angst spider man y like you know insecure teenager dealing with powers metaphor power fantasy all that classic stuff but it does it with a Muslim American teenage girl um, who becomes Miss Marvel uh, a sort of pre existing classic superhero that's been sort of reimagined uh, for the current for the current times, um, and the writer is um, G. Willow Wilson, and the artist is Adrian Alfano, who uh, a lot of people might know from the Runaways series, which was also really popular um, with teenagers and people who like uh, sort of like superhero comics that are in the Marvel Universe, but maybe not so entrenched in the Marvel Universe that you can't understand it, which is that tends to be a big problem for me. Yeah. A lot of times. And there's a little bit of that with this where they're referencing the Avengers and pre-existing characters, but for the most part you can identify those characters because they're pretty famous at this point. Um, but it's a really wonderful story and, and, and it really taps into all those classic Stan Lee, teen angst uh, stuff about you know not feeling like you're part of the group and trying to fit in with teen- you know other teenagers and being cool, but it does it specifically with a culture that as uh, as a white a male American, I may not know that much about. So it's it's insightful, and, and it, it feels like I'm being introduced to a culture that I don't know a lot about. Um, and I'm I'm hoping that they're doing a good job representing that. Um, but so far, so good. It's a, and it's very action packed, and the art is really cartoony and trippy and weird, and um, it reminds me a lot of. Uh, the, like the Plastic Man comics in some ways because she her powers allow her to sort of stretch and grow and transform into like really weird shapes and stuff and and that is one of the things that comics does so well is letting the illustrators just kind of go crazy um, with the proportions of the of her anatomy as it goes crazy and, huh. it, and it gets pretty crazy. I, I I haven't read it myself, but I've heard that it also isn't afraid to show downtime. Like they they will actually spend a sequence where she's just doing normal people stuff instead of always just fighting, fighting, fighting with like it's like you know like in Spider Man the cliche is that like fight, 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 web sling and think about all my problems. Show up at the bugle, get yelled at by Jameson, go back out, fight, 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 web sling and think about my problems. Right? Like you don't you don't get to see Peter Parker make toast. But I heard that like there's scenes in that that are actually more like watching people do normal things a little bit. Is that is that so or no? Um, that's certainly the case with another book that I'm going to mention. But um, <laughs> there, I guess there's a little bit of that. But I I I I'm going to say that it does feel it felt like Spider-Man to me in that sort of same way, except instead of 
J. Jonah Jameson, it's her parents um, or other teenagers that she's dealing with. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is a lot, you know, it, it, there's a lot of superheroics and there's robots and there's all the sort of stuff that you would expect from a superhero comic. Um, but the, but the human, but the, the characters feel human and, and the relationships feel real. Um, there's a lot of books that I feel like try to strike that balance between the superheroics and the human moments. Um, and this book definitely feels like it does a good job with that. Hmm. Um, so definitely worth checking out. Ms. Marvel. Ms. Marvel. I've heard a lot of great things about it. Yeah, and the volume is called No Normal, uh, the first trade paperback. And this is a definitely T T plus is what it's listed as. So not really for younger kids. There's definitely some real intense moments um, and teens drinking and partying and, and sort of the same sort of stuff that uh, Raina was mentioning in Tomboy. Um, although I think Tomboy is even more frank about it. This feels a little bit more like this is sort of like Teen Boat in the same way where it's like, you know, Teens going to parties and whether or not that's, you know, they're going to get in trouble for it and that kind of stuff. Okay, cool. Uh, Anne, did you want to go next or do you want me to? I can go next. Okay. I can take it completely back into indie comics away right. from Marvel. So I have here Worst Things Happen at Sea by Kelly Strom. I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. Um, it was published by Nobrow Press. And this book is really interesting because it kind of, it takes you away from comics. So as somebody who isn't necessarily into comics and you want to buy them a comic, it is this ongoing story of monsters and horrible things happening across seven seas. And it kind of looks like an engraving or a woodcut. So it, it crosses over into the fine arts realm, which people often complain that comics do not do. And I've heard that it took the artist, I want to say three years to do this. But it's amazing because there's so many little things going on. You can find different monsters and people, and it's just a really fun thing to explore. And there's also a sea ch- shanty on the inside of the jacket. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> and there's more <laughs> illustration on the back. So the whole thing comes out and unfolds, and you can just get totally absorbed into the adventure that is what's happening at sea with the monsters. The colors and like you said like the wood the woodcut engraving style of it is like yeah you can totally just get lost in this thing and the, the, the whole thing i don't know i want to pan back or pull back i mean the whole thing opens up into this gigantic mm. piece on both sides look at that oh hit my head that is amazing so this is like like for the 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 person who likes to get lost in those Where's Waldo books. Yeah, it it would totally be for somebody like that. Yeah, and for just art fans in general. Oh my god, yeah, like here's like the ship getting all smashed to pieces and there's, there's like a, a million people falling out of the... In one of the scenes, there's a narwhal and yeah, there's really cool <laughs> stuff going on. I, I was sold tortoises. as soon as I saw the narwhal. Giant tortoises with... um. Uh, a, a, a st- what is it? A, like a, a boat that's run aground on the back of the tortoise's back, and there's a guy who set up a campfire to like call for help from other people. Do you see that? Yes, that's pretty awesome. So this is "Worst Things Happen at Sea" by Kelly Strom, No Brow Press. No Brow. Are they the same people who do the Hilda books? I believe so. Yes, I think Hilda and the Midnight Giant. Okay, cool. All right. Well, for me, gosh, where do I want to start? Um, I'm gonna go. More mainstreamy, but not mainstream comics, right? Like when we say mainstream comics, we always think of superheroes or at least people in the comics world. But I mean like just general interest kind of thing. Uh, Box Brown's Andre the Giant. Now, I had a funny conversation with a 19-year-old a couple weeks back where they were looking at um, the guest list for a comic convention. And they saw a bunch of cartoonist names and they saw a bunch of pro wrestlers names. And this 19-year-old said to me, he's like, what does wrestling have to do with comics? And I was like, oh, that's right. It's more separate nowadays. But when we were kids, like, they seemed like, Dave, were you into pro wrestling when you were a little kid? A little bit at least? When I was a little kid. During the whole Hulkamania, Junkyard yeah. Dog, yeah. uh, Cindy Lauper time for wrestling. <laughs> when the Saturday morning cartoon was around. Because yeah, I was into it then too. Were you really? I loved the Saturday morning cartoon. Yeah. Okay. So like, yeah, they were just like really, really embedded in pop culture at that time. And now it seems like it's a little bit more distinct than like, like, uh, like the girls who are on Tumblr reading, uh, Noel Stevenson stuff aren't necessarily super into, you know, uh, dusty roads or whoever's popular now. <laughs> but anyway, it's, it's, uh, Box Brown did uh, a biography of Andre the Giant. Uh, this was published by First Second. 
And it is, uh, gosh, I, if you were a fan of Seth, if you were a fan of Fantagraphics books, I think you'd get a kick out of this. Um, the the art, at any rate, but also like the it's it's the story of how he it's the story of his life. It's the story of like growing up on a farm in in, in France and learning like just starting out being like just a really really big kid. Like he had couldn't take the bus anymore as of age twelve because he was just so large. But he but he didn't know until well into his twenties that he had some kind of condition that was like life threatening. Um. Uh, it's it's how it, it chronicles his rise to fame as a wrestler. It uh, tells a lot of stories that that come from uh, word of mouth. Other wrestlers who say like he did this, he did that. Uh, the man could drink. He could really drink. Like he would say, say bring me a quadruple. Um, a screwdriver in a pint glass and then he would say keep them coming and he spent it chronicles his life in japan uh how he became like a huge wrestling star in japan and then eventually became a huge star in the united states and then leads all the way up to wrestlemania 3 where he passes the torch to hulk hogan and it's really funny and somewhat heartbreaking uh and box brown you can tell he he really loves this the you know the subject matter and he has a lot of respect for andre but he doesn't pull any punches with some of the stories that he tells in there there's some things he does that aren't quite so wonderful um and and but it's always couched with this whole um this tension of having this really awesome life where he's surrounded by all these friends and he gets to travel and he gets to do all these exciting things but everywhere he goes he's treated like there's this giant monster in the room right uh, you can't go anywhere. Like, how do you become incognito when you're seven foot four and weigh six hundred pounds? You can't, right? And especially once you became like a wrestling star. But uh, it was it was a great read. And of course, for a second, I mean, just look for that logo and then just buy it. Uh, but uh, yeah, Box Brown, Andre the Giant. I really, really got a kick out of it. And uh, yeah, Box Brown does great stuff. So, who's next? Are we going back around the table? Sure, we can go back around the table. I gotta take this scarf. I'm, <laughs> right. I'm boiling over. So my next recommendation is um, Strong Female Protagonist, book one, by Brennan Lee Mulligan and Molly Ostertag. And this is a webcomic that was kickstarted very successfully into a graphic novel. And it's a story about a girl named Allison Green who was a superhero sort of in her past life and has decided to sort of leave those days behind and just be a regular girl and go to school for art in New York City. Um, but her past keeps kind of coming back to haunt her. So it's got sort of like a x men mutant type of culture going on. There are superheroes, there are supervillains... It's about class and prejudice and politics and just being, you know, a regular kid who sort of wants to read, read, lead a, a regular life and can't do so because she's sort of struggling with, with right versus wrong and superpower versus, you know, what do you do with that power? Um, and it's, it's really interesting and I'm proud of these guys for for doing this all by themselves and and turning it into something that's kind of taken on a life of its own that's a strong recommendation coming from you reyna because you don't typically go in for the action adventure mutant x men -y kind of stuff that's right true. that's true but um i mean dave and i delved into x-men pretty deeply when we were writing x-men misfits and there was a lot for me to like about it and this kind of has the same type of stuff that i liked about reading x-men and um, I don't know if you can still get the print version. I believe Molly just said in the last day or two that the print run sold out. And it was a pretty big print run. So, again, really proud of these guys. But you can read it online. So if you go to strongfemaleprotagonist.com, um, I'm assuming they will also reprint this shortly because they should. More people should read it. Or maybe a publisher will pick it up. Yeah, that's right. And they were, they're being distributed by Top Shelf also. So that makes it a little bit easier to get the book. And yeah, and if you were just ordering it directly from the creators, I, uh, did did we have a copy of that, or is it the library's copy? We were reading an arc. Oh, a okay. Arc. Okay, yeah. so yeah, that's right. Yeah, we have a. Okay, but so it it, it will be in the library's collection eventually. Okay. 
I, I just couldn't remember where I saw. I remember seeing you reading it, and I was trying to remember, like, do we have it? So where did it come from? Uh, so when you say that, Reina, like, it, it there's it dives into X many things that that you wound up liking. Specifically, can you name like just one of those things about like when you were digging into the X Men that you found that you liked that that also is reflected in this book? <laughs> um, just being different. Ah. Uh. Just people who are different from the rest of us or, or normal society, and how they how they grapple with that. Yeah, yeah. So living in a profound isolation of mm -hmm. being a young person, right? Which we all feel when we're young people. All right, cool. Strong female protagonist, and the link will be included in the show notes. Dave, what do you got? <laughs> what? Okay. Um, I, I think in some of my book reviews, I'm going to do like some groupings. But first, uh, Jersey, just to call back to the previous, show, I forgot to mention that um, I drew a snowman in the back uh, too, <laughs> hiding behind the uh, <laughs> hiding behind the Christmas tree there, actually so lurking ominously. Um, we've we've been going about 20 minutes. Last year's conversation about yeah. uh, my 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 love of snowmen. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, like, last year, I remember we took, like, a little bit of a break to t from doing the book recommendations to talk about, uh, to pick your brains about what are the holiday specials that you guys are most re responding to this year. Because uh, I was watching on Twitter, who, was it Tony Cliff who was, like, challenging you guys and giving you the, the, the throwdown of, like, look at this bank of holiday specials. I bet you there's at least a couple you haven't seen in here. And, like, there was, like, one. There was one. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, like I want, I want to take a break. Which from... I'm excited about. Anytime I find a new one, I'm excited about. Right. Well, yeah. No, no. You, you guys aren't. The... We can talk about that at the end. Um... No, no. I, I want to do it now. I want to do it. I want to take a break and like talk about what are the specials right now that that you guys are most responding to. Like, take a break from books. Talk about TV just for a second. What's what's the one holiday special everybody should watch this year? Uh... <laughs> we just watched the Elf. Uh, stop motion special, and that's definitely worth watching. That's good. The the visuals are worth watching. Like the those are some of the nicest looking stop motion puppets I've seen in a while. Elf, um, as in the based on the. It's an adaptation of the Broadway musical, which is an adaptation mm -hmm. of the film starring Will Ferrell. Oh. So wow. if you like, I, you'll love it, Jersey, because it's yeah. like it takes all the things you probably liked about Elf and has none of the things I didn't like about Elf. Hmm. Because my thing about Elf was that it was a great character, great setup, but then it was just an excuse to sort of do like poop jokes or like, you know, <laughs> uh, sort of crude humor or just sort of typical, like things that it would have been in any Will Ferrell movie. Yeah. This sort of strips all that stuff out and just makes it about the sincere Elf sort of making the world into like a more Elf-like, magical, Christmassy place, which uh, I think is more my speed. <laughs> um, but anyways, the puppets are just freaking amazing. Um, we also discovered a really old one from 1977 called A Cosmic Christmas. And I'm really curious uh, for you to check out Jersey. It's right. it's it's very um, no, it's by Nelvana, so it's Canadian, um, but it's called the Cosmic Christmas. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. Um, it's definitely like of its time. It definitely has that sort of like weird, uh, you know, just it's so hard to describe that sort of 70s animation style that like Ralph Bakshi was doing and just sort of uh, Twice Upon a Time and things like that, but. Definitely check that those out. Well, Nelvana did the Care Bears movie, did they not? They sure did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's not a testament to anything. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like, that <laughs> like, would be... Like, no, like, haven't you ever seen, like, any, like, sort of, like, Nirvana's sort of, like, weirder sort of... Stra like, you know, the th thing where, like, humans are just different colors for no good reason. Mm -hmm. Characters have, like, really strange proportions and are just sort of, like, overly animated in places where they... For, you know, like someone just can't just pick up a cup of coffee. They sort of have, there has to be like a crazy amount of frame cycles to pick up that cup of coffee. Okay. Yeah. Weird and stuff like that. All right. A Cosmic Christmas. I will check that out uh, in the coming weeks as we lead up to Christmas. Uh, and did you have a, a, a holiday special that is a, a go-to every year? What, 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 what's our go-to? What's our go-to? I'm blanking. I, I put you on the spot. You did put me on the spot. I haven't even started to delve Pro into probably holiday specials yet. The Elf Christmas episode. We do watch yeah, that every year. Yeah, we do watch that every year. Which it's is heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> it's just him saying no problem with, over uh, in front of a tree for a half hour, isn't it? Oh, I think that the world fell in love with Elf after the Elf Christmas special because I think I was in the fourth or fifth grade when it came out and I was getting made fun of shamelessly for liking Elf. And then that came out and everybody was like, oh, maybe Elf's okay. Because he, Aww. Elf has a heart. He Aww. he goes to a hospital and ends up helping people who are in need. 
he gets he, he's like because the whole like conceit of the show is he can't get be, he can't be seen by the public because then the, the 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 NASA scientists will come and dissect him right like in all alien stories. That's where the government would come and well, do in evil the eighties they always made NASA bad would do bad things to people. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trolling you, but but like so he gets like put on like a Toys for Tots cart or something like that, yes. and like and mistaken for a stuffed animal, and this little girl who's dying like befriends him and then he reveals that he's alive like in the zero hour so that he can comfort her in her final moments kind of thing oh my god it's hard it's a hard special to get through and he also rescues a man who is suicidal and it's yeah a guy's wife yeah. dies and then he's gonna give all of yeah, his stuff nothing away left to live for nothing left to live for and so Alf, Alf reveals himself to this man as well I say Christmas angel <laughs> <laughs> kind of it's a wonderful lifestyle <laughs> Itself. But it is, it actually is like really emotionally uh, difficult, right? Yes, I cry every year when I watch it. And I know what's coming and I still cry. <sighs> okay, all right. So break time over. Now we get to the, your next book recommendation, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, this would, this, this is sort of a double recommendation for uh, the recovering goths uh, out there, like myself. So even though I love snowmen now, I, you know, I, I went through my sort of, uh, melodramatic teen phase of which uh, Edward Scissorhands was a really, really big part of my teenagedom. Mm. I'm, I'm going to admit it. I, w- I, was, I was really into that movie, Edward Scissorhands, and yeah, I related to it, and I probably did very emo paintings inspired <laughs> by Tim Burton movies. Um, so for all those, those people, like myself, um, the Edward Scissorhands comic that just came out from IDW... Um, it's written by Kate Leth, and it's drawn um, by Drew Rausch. Uh, Drew has been an artist for Slave Labor Graphics on tons of projects for them, uh, mostly creator-owned stuff, um, some collaborations with other artists and writers. Um, this is a really high-profile thing for him, and his style is so... It's such an interesting choice because um, you can't tell from the cover, so I should probably see if I can open it up. Um, but the art is back to that lack of a better word, very cartoony, mm. uh, very sort of Chuck Jones animation, um, very expressive, uh, big eyes. It uh, kind of reminds me of the Beetlejuice cartoon. Yes, it does look sort of like the Beetlejuice uh, cartoon. I don't know why I didn't make that connection, and I wonder if Drew kind of intentionally uh, did that. Um, but the story picks up a couple, of, uh, quite a few years after... Uh, the movie and deals uh, with the granddaughter character that's introduced at the very end of Edward Scissorhands. Um, uh, and, and it's actually really kind of thoughtful and definitely for fans of that movie. They're, they're really respecting the mythology and trying to build off that and sort of doing a sort of logical next step. Um, um, it was actually really good. I, I, I bought this more as like a curiosity piece as like, Oh my God, I, I could never imagine an Edward Scissorhands comic you know, when I was a kid, like, I just, like, that's just crazy to me. Well, um, because it, it did a really good job with it. It's really, I, I, like, I didn't just like it just from a, like a nostalgic standpoint. I actually kind of enjoyed it just as a book. Like it's, it's, it's huh. actually pretty good. Well, yeah. I, it's, it's such a surprise considering the people involved, but I'm, I'm still a natural born skeptic when it comes to, uh, you know, childhood things being sort of brought back. Well, especially uh, because Edward Scissorhands is like this kind of self-contained fairy tale, right? Yeah. I don't know if I wanted to see more out of Edward Scissorhands. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know if he, like, is did anything after Winona exactly. Ryder's character dies, right? Exactly. But uh, that said, in comic form, you know, you can sometimes get away with that stuff. Uh, you can distance yourself enough from the movie, um, but they do a good job. Can I just real quickly add to that? Um, on a similar note, they're making new Sandman comics, and much like Edward Scissorhands, Sandman was a big part of my high school years, and I think a lot of people got into comics because of Sandman and stuff like Sandman. The the Vertigo line in the late 90s, early 2000s was like a huge... Uh, part of our lives, the edgy comics, um, the literary comics. Um, and I didn't, I don't think a lot of people may not even realize that there are, that they're making new Sandman comics and that Neil Gaiman is writing them. Um, I found out this because I was in Miami and a guy found out I, I like comics and started talking to me about the comics he liked and mentioned it. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know they're making new Sandman comics. That seems like a really big deal to people of my generation. Um, and it's drawn by J.H. Williams the third. 
holy cow, that guy is a really good illustrator. Um, they're really, really, really beautiful. Um, and similar to uh, the book that Ann just showed, it's got a fold-out spread that folds out. <laughs> 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 it's got the double fold-out spread, uh, crazy, elaborate scenes like that. Um, oh, wow. I first saw in Frank Miller's Ronin uh, mm -hmm. book. That blew me away. So, yeah. You know, speaking of intended audiences for these things, something I found in my years of teaching is that um, to this day, I still get in my teen classes or in my preteen classes uh, that little girl who just reads nothing but manga. Like all she'll read is like she, you know she's she's plowing through bleach she's plowing through uh you know fruits basket, and that's all she'll read. And the parents will say, uh, "How do we get her to read something beyond manga? You know, even other comics. Just you know that that's all I can get her to read." And that, and that always makes parents go, Ugh, "I'm I'm nervous." And I found that a lot of times Sandman is like the bridge comic to introduce them back into Western comics. Like it works every time. They turn 13, give them Sandman, and then boom, they're like, oh, there's a world beyond manga, and now I have a wider appreciation of comics. Like if I put Avengers in front of them, doesn't work. But if I put uh, Sandman in front of them, that seems to always do the trick. And Fables, too, but Fables is a little bit older. I wouldn't want a 13-year-old necessarily <laughs> reading Fables. Hey, hey Jersey. Yes. Um, I know we're, we're supposed to go in order, but... You, you that might. segues so perfectly into one of my recommendations. Please. Did I throw it in here? Okay. So this is the Dirty Diamonds anthology, which is published by Claire Folkman and Kelly Phillips, I believe, right? Kelly Phillips? Kelly Phillips. Um, and it's an all-girl anthology of um, various topics, depending on the issue. But this one is about comics. So it's all stories about the creator's first um, exposure to comics. Oh, wow. Like, what got them into them and what got them drawing them. And you see a lot of stories about Sailor Moon. Mm. You see a story about Captain Underpants. You see a story <laughs> about the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all from different creators. Um, and it's really cool to read because it's, like, their stories of how they fell in love with the thing and then how that related into them becoming professionals and oh, doing wow. this now as adults and as the people that they have become. Who put that out? It's um, like an indie anthology called Dirty Diamonds, and their um, website's dirtydiamonds.net. I was right. Claire Folkman and Kelly Phillips are the editors, and I think it's like an ongoing thing. So they do a different subject for every anthology. This is issue number issue number five. Wow. Yeah, it's awesome. All right, Dirty Diamonds. Uh... Dot net. Dot net. All right, cool. All right, well, speaking of comics on the web... I'll get to one of my recommendations. I have be become obsessed with this comic, uh, and this is a comic by Megan Brennan. It's called Pencil Pup. I know I've talked it up in a lot of places, but uh, she has done something really unique and special with this comic. Uh, it is about... Did, did I do this one last year, Dave? Tell me I didn't. You've talked about it on Comics Are Great, okay. you know, specifically on the Christmas episode. But she's got three volumes out now. Right, and like, first of all, these mini comics are so darn cute. I mean, she like made the first volume where it's like a, a composition book that when you open it up, like there's like the notebook paper and there's pencil pup, and it, and uh, the second one is like a, I don't know what kind of book this is. It's like 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 a scrapbook kind of deal, uh, with another cut image that opens to the notebook paper. The third one is this amazing Lisa Frank cover. That, that with the the sparkly tape on the side, and I know she went through a lot of trouble to find just the right kind of sparkly tape to bind the book. But what's it about? What's the content? Uh, it's about a girl who wakes up in this weird paper dimension where she doesn't know where she is. She doesn't know why how she got there. She doesn't even know her name. We don't even know the girl's name, and we're three volumes in on this thing. And there's this little puppy with pencils for legs who keeps talking in this cheerful kind of uh, larger than life way where like the, the speech, I don't even know if we can see this, but like pencil pups speech will be like these giant word clouds behind him. And he's cheerfully uh, ordering her to draw things with him and be a pal. And then there's this helper owl who shows up who doesn't give her much help. And it's all about her trying to figure out where she is, why she's there, and how do I get out. And every time she tries to leave or get away, she makes Pencil Pup very sad. And when Pencil Pup gets sad, he gets kind of angry in, in a very kind of cute and scary way. So like I've said before, it reminds me of 
the Twilight Zone episode. Do you remember this one, Ann? The one where like the, the four people wake up in this room with no door, and there's like a clown, and there's like a military guy, and there's a ballerina, and they don't know why they're there. Do you remember that one? Yes. And it then, does have that same feel. Yeah, it has like this kind of like eerie, cute feeling to it of of this this anxious, how do I get out of here? There's something sinister going on, but it's adorable. So it's Yeah, a, when you pick it up, you think that it's just going to be cuteness that's going to overwhelm you, but then there's this dark side, this lovely, eerie dark side that yeah. just it's creepy. But I mean this kind of goes back to like the Edward Scissorhands thing, Dave is like, like I think of Tim Burton stuff. Tim Burton navigates that line very well. He can make it something that feels cute and warm, but also kind of creepy. But she does it in a way where it emphasizes the cute first and the creepy is in like the undertones of the book. Uh, anyway, she's doing something super special with this book, and I think everybody should be going to PencilPop.com and reading it and buying all the mini comics. And how has she not been published yet is what I want to know. So PencilPop.com. Get it for anybody who enjoys uh, cute things and the Twilight Zone. I would say that's the audience for this thing. Uh, and I, I love it. So who wants to go next? Anne, do you want something? Let's see. I'm probably going to take it in a totally different direction. Although this, this kind of doesn't. Let's see. We've got Jules Pfeiffer. Kill my mother. Not autobiographical. He <laughs> does not want to kill his mother. Uh, okay. This is taking us back to... You want me to take I'll, it? I'll give that to you. All right. For those not familiar with Jules Pfeiffer, he usually does like satiric, political, um, social commentary and lovely line drawings. Um, this is his take on a noir comic, um, kind of shooting back to the days of Will Eisner and Milton Kniff, um, like the spirit. Um, also kind of reminiscent of noir movies like uh, Maltese Falcon, Big Sleep, those sorts of things. So um, it also, the art style, it's, you can tell it's Jules Pfeiffer because of the, the line work, the very loose, sketchy, beautiful line work. Um, I love his stuff. Uh, but also he um, kind of does a throwback to American Realist painting, um, which is something that Will Eisner did as well. So um, it's harking back to Maybe like the the forties and fifties storytelling um, serials, those types of stories, not the serials that everybody is all crazy about right now, which is on NPR. It's <laughs> it's not that type of serial, although there is like, crime involved. Like, but like, it's like an ongoing story, escapist, like Great Depression era type of serial, and this is definitely for adults. But I think that most anyone who likes a good mystery uh, is going to love this. And and is a fan of like 1940s kind of movies and noir film and also just like really really cool uh, like energized art like that it's got like that awesome scribbly thing that he does where like it looks loose and unfinished but it leaves so much life in all the figures yeah it's just showing movement in a a wonderful minimalistic way yeah yeah he's awesome when did this come out this year really yeah. Oh, kill my mother! Graphic novel by Jules Pfeiffer. I got okay. I gotta, I gotta hijack it and go to mine because my I got one that's related to that. Uh, who here has read Brood Hollow by Chris Straub? Anybody? Um, and I got a digital version on my tablet. So Brood Hollow is a comic. It's a web comic, but he's also been collecting them in uh, print form. It's at broodhollow dot com, and it's it takes place in the nineteen thirties, and it is. Uh, I would describe it as. X Files meets Twin Peaks meets Northern Exposure meets Gilmore Girls. Uh, it's it's like this weird like this guy uh, Wadsworth Zane inherits an antique store in this strange 1930s town where everybody says things like uh, you know they say all sorts of uh, now you're on the trolley you know like old like 1930s expressions. Um, and Wadsworth has uh, a little bit of an obsessive compulsive disorder where he has this pattern through which he lives his life where doors must always remain shut. And if a door is even like a little bit of a crack open, he's like, that's a problem. That's a problem. We got to shut that. Why, why, why is that shelf open? Why is that drawer open kind of thing? Uh, but it gets revealed over time that there's, there's something to this pattern because when he leaves the door ajar one night, these glowing eyes are in the closet kind of thing. And it turns out that this town, Brood Hollow, has some kind of supernatural bend to it. And it's all about him trying to... Uh, navigating these crazy, colorful local characters. Like, you've got, like, the the local lawyer slash real estate agent who wants to take over the antique shop. And, you know, he's like, oh, you're an interloper. You don't even like this town. I should have that antique shop. You're just here because you inherited it. Um, you know, these these guys, there's like these local boys, these local toughs who are like, 
big, strong guys with giant mustaches who seem really uh, intimidating but are actually really cheerful guys. Um, he, they it's during Prohibition, so they they make their own special drink out of it, like some kind of crazy tree bark. Eventually, Wadsworth takes on a little bat as a pet. Uh, so it's got like that kind of colorful character thing that you see in like old shows like New Heart and Northern Exposure and stuff. But it's got like this really seriously creepy horror thing to it. And one of the things that Chris Straub has talked about when he came on the Comics Are Great show, as a matter of fact, is that he was it, one of the things he was exploring was how humor and horror share a lot of the same mechanics. Like, uh, you know, the jump scare, the punch lines, misdirecting your your expectations and then uh, surprising you with something. And one of the things he does in the book that I was really surprised by is he actually pulled off what I felt was like a jump scare in a comic, which is kind of hard to do when you think about it. Like when you have static images juxtaposed together, as Scott McCloud would say. But um, it's it's if you're a fan of 1930s kind of fiction, if you, if you like your Steinbeck and you like your horror then I think you would enjoy Brood Hollow. That's at broodhollow.com. So who's next? Did, did anybody have a segue from that? <laughs> uh, well, sort of balancing the creepy and the cute, or I guess, and the funny too, yeah. Uh, the Hilda books, uh, I think you were mentioning these a little bit before, published by Nobrow Press, which is a really great uh, indie publisher, I think based out of the UK. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the book series is by Luke, Pearson, who, oh my God, I, I, you know, this is one of those things where people were talking about it for a couple of years, and I was kind of slow to get on the bandwagon, um, but once I did, and and it, I, I, I equate it to the experience I had when I first watched My Neighbor Totoro uh, by Miyazaki, my first Miyazaki movie. Oh wow! Th- these books have that same level of just like, what is this? Where has this been my whole life? <laughs> Why doesn't everybody know about this? Um, it's a wonderful... Uh, I've only read three of them so far, but uh, they all star this girl, Hilda, who's just sort of an average kind of girl, almost like a, a little Lulu type of classic, iconic girl cartoon character. Um, but she always sort of lives in a... She sort of moves around and, and lives in uh, different settings that are clearly mystical, there seems to be, you know, trolls or creatures or monsters sort of living in the forest or underneath rocks, um, and kind of gets involved in very supernatural adventures with the sort of mystical creatures that surround her. That's the best way to describe it. But the reason to read it is just because it's, I think, comics at its best. Um, kids' comics, especially all ages. Com- this truly is the all ages uh, moniker. I, I'm. I can't not talk about it with hyperbole because I, when I read it, it's it's like a punch in the face, it's a punch in the gut. Like, I recommend a lot of comics all the time, but this these comics were the ones that I was just like, this is the best thing. Like this, like it reminds me of when I read Calvin and Hobbes. Like you're just like this is just comics at its best. Like this guy is so young and doesn't even realize like how talented he is, <laughs> and he's just making comics that just do all the things that are great about comics. Um, and I can't say enough good things about it. And if you really want to get all out, you know, with Christmas, you can't just give uh, comics. You got to give some toys. So I'm oh, wow. recommend the Hilda the Hilda toy. I didn't uh, know there was a Hilda Flying toy. Eye books, uh, which is the I think the all ages imprint of uh, No Brow Publishing. Like, this toy of Hilda is beautiful. Comes in a really gorgeous box designed by the cartoonist featuring his art, and, like, no, and it even has a comic on the back. Ah. The so Have now, they only I made Hilda? Not the person who like, wants to keep all his toys in a box, but it's been a hard, I've been, it's hard to take it out because the box is just as beautiful as... <laughs> are any toy. of the creatures that are featured in the books made into toys as well, or right now is it just Hilda? I don't know if they've yet been made into toys, uh, but they're definitely featured on the box. Um, you know, this is just so cool, like, to see a character that's, you know, this is not, like, a super famous character yet. This is, like, you know, uh, there have only been a few books. It's by a sort of smaller press. So to see a really beautiful toy made, uh, you know, from the drawings of this cartoonist is really exciting for me as a fellow cartoonist. <laughs> um, but, yeah, holy cow, the Hilda books are so good. So good. Wow, wow. So I, 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 just... I recommend them, like, more. Like, those are sort of, like, my cross-year, like, there are certain books that I would say that were the best books that I've read all year, but when I read these, when I when I read Hilda in the middle of the 
Midnight Giant, I was like, this is one of the best books I've ever read. Wow. What I also love is that trade is equally uh, as fun. I love also the the format. They're doing that great great big album format that you see in Europe, but you don't see in the United States so much, right? Uh, yeah, and every page has like lots of panels, and you just can pour through them, and it's just they're so spooky and moody <laughs> and lush and evocative. So yeah. the Hilda books, Raina, go. So, I mean this this book actually kind of gets into a similar space as the Helda books, but with a little bit more distance. It's a book called Nothing is Forgotten by Ryan Andrews. This is also self-published through Kickstarter, and it's a, com it's a collection of four short stories that the cartoonist has published online and has now collected them, and they're sort of stories about characters wandering through environments and looking for things, and it, you know, they're, they're like little poems, so they touch on life and death and aging and birth and um, love and loss and all the things you want in good stories, but they're short and satisfying. And Ryan is a really wonderful illustrator. He's working mostly in black and white with occasional touches of color. Um, and you see giants wandering through landscapes, and you see trees with eyes in them and tunnels and um, stuff like that. It's very evocative, and you can read some of them online still. I know he published Nothing is Forgotten, the short story, as a Tumblr piece. And he was just putting up one panel either per day or per week or whatever it was. So people were reading the story as it was unfolding. And um, now you can sit down and read it again and again. And um, I recommend it to people who like Miyazaki and people that like Emily Carroll's work. It's got a similar sensibility. Sort of horrific, but not necessarily scary. Hmm. So, like, maybe haunting? Would that be... Yeah, I think of it as haunting, for sure. I believe he goes by Hey Ryan A on the internet. <laughs> hey Ryan A. All right, and the link it will be in the show notes to the book as well. All right, I got to get to... Uh, we're, we're almost in lightning round, guys, because we are coming up on the end. But I got I to gotta talk about Sing No Evil. Can we talk about Sing No Evil? Yeah! <laughs> uh, by JP Ahonen and KP Alari. Um, yeah, first of all, I mean, just the cartoonist in me is like, this dude knows how to color. He knows how to color so good, so good. Um, but content, let's let's recommend it for content. Anybody who has been listening to this show for any amount of time has heard me go on and on about why I think comics are the greatest thing in the entire world, how they're like poetry to me, and how like they're the, the highest form of visual communication in the entire world. And I've also gone on record to say... Um, Talking with people who are really, really jazzed about something always makes me a little bit more jazzed about the thing. Like you talk to a person who's like really, really into bicycles and they're like so into bicycles they can tell you they can talk for hours about bicycles. And, I'm, and I walk away going like, wow, I kind of like bicycles a lot more now. This book will do that for music. Uh, it, the, he actually like the, the story is all about how, how music is so awesome that it is literally like magic. <laughs> it's it, and like you can perform magic with music. But he even takes care to tie it into science where it says like when you go into string theory about where all matter is just just uh, energy vibration that's like all that turns into atoms that turns into molecules that turns into us um, like there's even a little bit of that in there. But what is it about? It's about this it's about this kid who's alone and special. He like really, really loves music. He's in this band and he wants it to be perfect, but he's just not doing that terrific of a job of it. And he's he's jeopardizing his relationship with his wife. Uh, and nobody seems to understand what, what he's really going for in his work. And when he's alone and he's working really hard at it, he finds that doing the music his way right, like he found himself levitating at one point. He thought, well, maybe I'm just hallucinating. And there's this weird old guy who's in the band who's like, oh, the last time, I, I, this reminds me when I played with The Who. This reminds me when I played with The Rolling Stones. And he seems to have a million stories about his uh, life as a musician. Uh, and the old man reveals like, oh, I'm actually 632 years old and like, whatever, you know, you just, you did too many shrooms back in the day. Right. Uh, but, th but there's like a suspension of disbelief because all the bands in the story have animals as drummers for some reasons, like the, the band that, the, that they play and there's a bear who's a drummer. Another band has, a uh, what is it? It's a badger for a drummer. Um, and uh, so, like, there's this weird kind of, like, unreality to the story, but things get really weird when we discover that the music, when done just the right way, actually does make uh, 
it bends reality in certain ways and bad things can happen if you don't do it right. And I want to find this, this page where <laughs> the scenes where he's doing like this, this death metal band or this black metal band who's just screaming Satan. Look at just the, first of all, the coloring and also the way he expresses sound in the story is so good. Um, I first encountered this book. I think it was still published in Finnish. I was at Bannister's house. We were in France visiting and I Bannister handed it to me, and I started flipping through it. And every page, I was just like, "Ah, jeez!" <laughs> ah! I was so, I was like pissed off and really happy because it's so good to look at. And I couldn't read it because it wasn't in English. But yeah, I was just like, oh, oh god, that yeah, that's that that's like the highest compliment you could pay a comic, right? Is when you're like, it's making you so happy, but making you so sad at the same time. And I didn't need to read it because it was so it was such a good comic. Oh, it's so good. The words almost don't even matter. I mean, that's that's a total disservice to the the writer. That's not true at all. But you know what I mean. I know what you mean. Yeah, I mean, nonetheless. But like, he does all this great stuff with sound too, where like he covers up a word balloon with musical notes to show that it's difficult to hear what the guy's saying over top of the music that's going on in the background. He does things where the musical notes, this band is like playing a lot of electronic music. So all the musical notes have these hard edges and are more mathematical instead of like with the curves of the musical notes that we typically see. He does all these wonderful little subtle things to make us hear the music in the story, which you got to think about it. It's a challenge to try to tell a story with a lot of music in it when it's a comic, which is a silent medium. But, um, but in the end, our hero discovers that uh, you know pr- pursuing the music to perfection uh, can can yield wonderful and disastrous results. And there's this really really great idea that they they explore with vinyl, and how vinyl is just capturing vibrations onto plastic, and and the the universe is made of vibrations after all. And they find this old relic with these grooves on it. And when they try to do something with that, bad things come out of it. So I won't spoil any more of that. You got to read it. It's so good. It's got bears playing the drums, people. Uh, <laughs> but but it's also God. just beautifully done. And I would recommend this to anybody uh, who, I mean, comics reader or not, uh, but especially that friend of yours who is like really really into music and like has like a large vinyl collection all alphabetized. Uh, I think that they will really appreciate that. You could tell that JP really loves music a lot. Um, and I think that he'll be preaching to the choir, to the, the person in your life who actually goes to the record store still. So, sim- Can I build off that real quick with, yes. a, with a quick uh, mm-hmm. mention of two books for the music fan? of uh, There's actually two books that came out in the past two years about uh, the concept of the fifth Beatle. One is literally called The Fifth Beatle, um, and that one's about Brian Epstein, the Beatles manager, who had a really integral role into the creation of the Beatles. Now, I did not grow up listening to the Beatles. I don't know a lot about Beatles lore, um, so this was kind of an interesting read to find out, you know, about the sort of, you know, the, the creative behind the creative, you know, the, the person who helped uh, do the sort of the business side and sort of, you know, worked hard for the Beatles, you know, behind the scenes. And, and, and there's a great quote from Paul McCartney on the back that says, if anyone was the fifth Beatle, it was Brian. Um, and yet there's this other book about Stuart Sutcliffe, who is another person who people consider the fifth Beatle. Um, he was the bassist in the band. Um, Wait, guess, what's, what's the title? Babies Black? This one is called Babies in Black. Babies in Black and this was published uh, by First Second. I think it also, like us, uh, I think it was also a, an import um, of a French comic. Um, and this one's in black and white in a sort of really charcoal, beautiful uh, style. Um, so for people who have, you know, the Beatles fan in their life, you might want to try one of these two books and or both and have a you know a book talk uh, comparing and contrasting them and you can decide for yourself who really is the fifth beetle um, Pete both, Best uh, Pete Best was comics. All right so cool um <laughs> All right, so we'll get to lightning round. I wanna, I wanna recommend this book. This is by uh, he is a friend of mine, but uh, I love his work. And this is Beyond the Canopy by Jonathan Griffiths. And uh, who's it for? Who's it for? It is for the person in your life who can't put down the Nintendo DS. If they, <laughs> the, the person who has the 3DS and they can't stop playing it. Uh, here's here's a world to get lost in that feels like a really awesome, funny Nintendo game. And the big idea is that there's these little uh, sprite characters who are um, uh, plant-based, 
and this little boy gets mixed up with some uh, sarcastic talking skeletons. And the best part is when he goes to the, a lot of the story revolves around this this uh, restaurant called Che Cluckoff, run by a guy with a bag over his head named Grellis, who uh, whose entire staff is chickens. It's an entire uh, cooking and waiting staff of chickens who do not talk. They don't say like, "Hi, I'm a chicken." They only say "buck, buck, buck." And it's really funny, and it's uh, it's beautifully drawn. And there's two volumes out now. As a matter of fact, I've got to give Anne a present on the air uh, <laughs> because we didn't have we didn't have volume two yet. So I had John spe- uh, personalize a copy of Beyond the Canopy volume two. So Merry Early Christmas! Thank you. I can't mm-hmm. wait to read it. <laughs> You're supposed to look like really excited like, say, look how happy this makes her. I'm extremely <laughs> excited to read this. I've been wanting to read this for a long time, and we kept forgetting to get it when he was here. And... But he, he did a special drawing for you on the inside of the, the sloth creature. See? I love it. Sign uh, personalized books yeah, are, are even... That's how you can upgrade uh, your comics gift, is get it signed, because cartoonists always draw in the books. So, yes, you can get it from John... Uh, and on his website, beyondthecanopy.com, and you can order personalized copies there for your There might still be time. There might still be time. If you order today, today. Uh, lightning round. Okay, just name the book and who it's for. Dinosaurs in Space by Pranus T. And I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I don't know if anybody can help me out. It's Najokitis. Najokitis. Uh, this is for anyone who loves dinosaurs in space. It tells you that the dinosaurs did not die on the Earth, and <laughs> there are more adventures with dinosaurs. And it is for kids. Um, young kids could be uh, preschool through death. It's fantastic. <laughs> and one more book that was one of my absolute yeah, favorites this year. This? El yeah. Defo. Um, <laughs> El Defo. Did Holy I just steal cow. one of Brainy's? Let's, well, let's both. Have, everybody can everybody talk, about, talk El about El Defo because this was one of my absolute favorite books this year. She did Mine too. a fantastic job of telling her story, um, her experiences uh, with going to school, having the phonic ear. The phonic ear, yes, that gave her these special abilities to. Here, wherever the teacher went, she could hear what the teacher was yeah, saying, so what she, the teacher was doing. She lost her hearing when she was really young. And so then the doctor gives her this thing called the phonic ear, which is like this big mechanical contraption she wears under her shirt, right? And then the teacher puts on a microphone, and then by the teacher talking normally, the microphone amplifies and broadcasts to her phonic ear, which she, you know wears headphones. Then she can hear the teacher more clearly. But then she discovers that if the teacher didn't take off the microphone, and she goes to the bathroom, I get to hear her going to the bathroom. You're in, f- 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 uh, what was it, third, fourth, fifth grade, and you tell your friends, I, I'm listening to our teacher go to the bathroom right now. You are a superhero, and she is a superhero in the story. But, uh, but it's also about friendship, right, Raina? It's also about Absolutely. growing up. No, this is this is my favorite book of the year. I mean, it's it's my favorite book of maybe the last five years. I think it's amazing. It's got a ton of buzz going. We're hoping that it's gonna rack up some uh, fun, exciting awards in 2015, and it deserves to. It's it's phenomenal. It is. It's a, it's this a, is a book for anybody and everybody. It, yeah. it, it she is. does a fantastic job of really. I don't know how she can remember that well what it was like to be a kid because reading this book, it took me back to, wow, yeah, that is exactly how it felt to be (laughs) in that grade and to be thinking that way and to be that obsessed with that thing. We were talking about this last night. There's a scene where a kid offers her some Fritos and then like like, in her head, she starts doing a pro and con list of whether she wants to be friends with that person. She's like, a pro, (laughs) she gave me Fritos, con, she's kind of (laughs) pushy. But then she becomes friends with her because, after all, she did give her Fritos. Uh, but she also does – I mean, okay, so when we say this book is for anybody, something that I see a lot of comics – not a lot, but some comics publishers, and I'm not going to name names, they do books that have somewhat straightforward – four panel box on a page storytelling because they're really trying to get people who don't read comics and let's face it when you get into like a Scott McCloudian kind of like like biz- bizarre simultaneous layout like he did with his Zot web comic that can be confusing for some adults who haven't read comics in a long time and I've seen it in my classrooms where adults will say to me why is the artist doing this to me I don't understand so you'll see them do like this kind of pulled back very grid style storytelling to appeal to the non comics reader but what Cece does in El Defo is she writes something that is so clear, yet so comics and so visually clever, but it's not playing a trick. It's not trying to show off. It's not trying to be like, oh, look at this amazing layout that I'm doing. She does things that comics does especially well, like the way she, she shows how it feels to be deaf when she's watching somebody talking and the word balloon is blank. Uh, and then, or if like she'll, somebody will be saying something. She, she does like really cool ways to like represent how sound 
visually represents sound for somebody who's hard of hearing in this book, but she does it in a way that you just don't question. You don't even think twice about it, and I think it'll be eminently clear to anybody who's never even read a comic before. Uh, so and that's another thing I get so excited about this book is it introduces a wider audience to the great mechanics that comics has as a medium, right? And doubly awesome because comics don't actually have sound. So right. It's, it's, it's a recreation of sound or it's a, a representation of sound. Yeah, here she is listening to her teacher go to the bathroom. <laughs> Oh, it's so good. Yeah, no, CeCe's a hero in my mind uh, with this book that she did. So, yes, and she was just on NPR. I uh, was just listening to the the day. She was on uh, the weekend, All Things Considered, and uh, it was a great piece. We can link to that in the show notes as well. So, El Defo. Anything else that we need to say about that besides everybody should read it? Everyone should read it. Yeah, everybody it's should great read for it. school teachers in, in class. And uh, there's a book called Wonder that's really popular that deals with bullying and relating to people. And this is definitely like the sort of – a book on that sort of same level. Like every kid should have this in their school. All right. Uh, just a couple minutes left. Uh, any other lightning rounds that we need? That... Yes. Yes. Um, for a second is publishing picture books now that are sort of like half picture book, half uh, graphic novel. Ben Hackey did one called Julia's House for Lost Creatures. Anyone who likes Miyazaki again, you're going to love this. It's awesome. But the one that was actually my personal favorite was called The Zoo Box. Um, and it was by Ariel Cohn and Aaron Nels Steinke. This feels like a Maurice Sendak book. This is like one of the best picture books I've read in a long time. Um, it's really surreal. It's creepy. It's funny. It's uh, enchanting. Um, it's about kids who dress up like animals and go to a zoo where humans are the animals in the zoo um, and then get chased by the animals who think that the kids uh, you know, escaped from the zoo. It's really, really weird and great and everything about it is wonderful and I think kids will love it. And I've got, for the opposite crowd, um, can't we talk about something more pleasant by Roz Chast, a New Yorker cartoonist who's doing autobiography here to talk about her parents at the end of their lives and the stuff that you have to deal with when that goes down and that's something that um, a lot of older people and younger people too can probably relate to. Um, this is like a book for my dad who's, uh, my grandmother passed away a few years, years ago, and so just kind of watching him go through that process was hard for me, it was hard for him. Um, this is the book to say, you're not alone. This happens to every one of us, or it will happen to us soon. So, highly recommended. I love Roz Chazd. I've been hearing a lot of positive buzz about that book, too. I mean, she's been getting talked about. It's also very funny. I, <laughs> it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, well, yeah, that's. What I mean, I mean, like the positive buzz I hear is like it's really good, not like good. oh, it's so fun to talk about this. All right? Like, uh, <laughs> did did we want? There was one that I wanted to. Can we talk about that Kirby book? Oh um, yes. Because the, the, I want to also target the, the the people who have a budding artist in their in their midst, you know, like the young person or even the teenager who's like, man, maybe I want to go into comics illustration. I'm so excited that more of these books are coming out that are reprinting original artwork. By cartoonists, you know, like the, the four of us went to the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum uh, this past summer to look at the Bill Watterson exhibit. And part of what was fun for me was watching Dave and Raina go agog at Whiteout mm. on a page. <laughs> <laughs> like the way you guys like, look, look at how many times he erased this and look how he fixed this. You know, it's cool to see these these books coming out with untouched Re, uh, you know, reproductions of original art where you can see all the white out and the erasers and the scribble marks and where they cut something out and paste it over top. And uh, Abrams just put out the art of uh, the Simon and Kirby studio by uh, Joe Simon, Jack Kirby, edited by Mark Evanier. It's a great book for somebody who is into comics art in your life. Um, there's a whole bunch of books like this. Coming. IDW's got a whole series uh, of these like where they're reprinting art at original size. Um you can find these at most bookstores. I think that's at every bookstore. Yeah, I'm sure you can. Yeah, I'm sure you can. It's Abrams for crying out loud. All right, uh, last round. Anybody who wants right. to take it? I'm gonna throw. Uh, can I put a convention to uh, for a new, a brand new comic, super brand new from Kaboom, uh, called Capture Creatures, and it's by uh, Frank and Becky, or Becky and Frank. Um, uh, Frank Gibson and Becky Drysdat, who have been web cartoonists for a long time. They've done amazing comics. Um, uh, and they have a new series that definitely plays to the Pokemon fans. Mm -hmm. I would say that this is like Pokemon meets Steven Universe, um, but 
you know, with an original twist too. But uh, it's very fun, um, and it's got little creatures that are very much like Pokemon. So if you have a, a kid who's like, ah, I love Pokemon, and that's all I love, I give them this book, and I think they'll probably like that too. Awesome. Okay, and did you have one more? I was going to throw in my one of my other favorites from that I read this year, and Raina, sorry, but I love this book, <laughs> Sisters. Everyone should read Sisters. I, we know everybody is already loving all of these books because they've been on the New York Times bestseller list for so long. But another just amazing job where it, you did a great job of getting the feel for what it was like to be in yeah. that age and wondering if your cousins are going to think you're cool because I remember that feeling and I just you did it so perfectly and it was just a beautiful book and wonderfully done and everyone should read it. And the, there's, there's this love, and I already told you this privately, Raina, but there's this lovely poeticism of the headphones in the story where, you know, there's a lot of fighting between Raina and Amara. Amara or Amara? It's Amara. Amara. I apologize, Amara. That's okay. Uh, but like, there's this this tension with these darned headphones and there's just this moment where the book doesn't have like this big like, you know, I thought about that summer and this is what I learned after all. No, no wonder years moment. It ends very quietly and lets you kind of draw your own conclusions. But there's this wonderful moment of closure where Raina takes the headphones off and it's it's just a simple panel, but it's so powerful in taking off those headphones. It's so good. So, yeah, sisters, if you haven't read it yet, if you haven't heard of it, for crying out loud, go get it. <laughs> Seven more books and Raina will have taken what? over the New York Times bestseller list. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> Deservedly so. So, yeah. All right. Um, Gosh, guys. What, 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 Dave? What are you doing? Oh, I don't know what. Oh, oh okay. I thought you were reaching for something. Oh, because we have a ton of books that we didn't. Yeah. I know. Yeah, we've got piles we here, just, too. We'll hold them up to the camera. Oh, the Warren Commission report yeah. uh, for the crazy uh, conspiracy theorist <laughs> note in your life. <laughs> yes, um, that's who we wrote it for. Jersey. By Jersey Joe's and Dan Mishkin, Dan Mishkin and Ernie Cologne. <laughs> uh, we've got Star Wars Ewoks for the person in your life who doesn't. He's not ashamed to admit that the Ewoks are awesome. Yeah. Uh, Basically, buy this book for Dave. Zach Giolongo did an amazing job tying uh, tons of Star Wars continuity together. Um, oh, and just real quick, The Shadow Hero. This was another one of the best books yeah. of the year for yeah. me. Uh, definitely one of the best superhero comics. Again, sort of adding, sort of focusing on diversity in comics, but also just a really great story. Just one of the best superhero stories I've read in a long time. It reminded me why I love superheroes in the first place and it makes it it's just sort of like a love letter to superhero comics. Gene um, Yang. Just really well written and well drawn. Is Gene Yang ever gonna drop the ball? No, he is not. No. And Sonny Liu, amazing. Who knew I had no idea that Sonny Liu would draw such an amazing superhero comic. I was a huge fan of his from other books like Wonderland and uh Malinky Robot, but Holy cow, he did a fan freaking fantastic job. <laughs> <laughs> and there's lots of lists. Like the Scholastic has a list of, of best comics of the year, and there are other places you go. Just look for best comics. The NPR has a great uh, list of uh, best comics of the year, so you can check those out as well. But uh, that was our list as best as we could do in the hour and change that we had. Raina and Dave, thank you guys so much for closing out another year of Comics Are Great with me. Yay. Thanks for having us. We love it. <laughs> and and one more time, today is the last day to get signed books by Raina from the Astoria Bookshop. And uh, Eric got, got the link in the chat for us. Thank you, Thank Eric. You, Eric. Uh, and that was uh, one more time. Where is it? AstoriaBookshop.com. Is that right? Oh, my God. He put Raina. Yeah, that's that's right. Yes. AstoriaBookshop.com slash Raina. And then also Astronaut Academy T-shirts. Is today the last day for that, too? think so. Smile t-shirts and Astronaut Academy t-shirts and Teen Boat t-shirts. And you can get all that on the Comics Bakery website. Comicsbakery.com. Mm -hmm. Alright, thanks so much, guys. And Anne, uh, we got an event coming up in January. Do we have a date on that? January 27th. It's Tuesday, and it's the Web Comics Lab from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And at the Mallets Creek. At the Mallets Creek branch. And do we want to drop who the guest is? Do you want to do an exclusive? We can do an exclusive drop of the special guest, Brad Geiger. Brad Geiger of webcomics.com and the Webcomics Weekly Podcast. Yeah, we will be Skyping him in. So bring your questions, any how to create webcomics questions. That's a great resource to have at the lab. So uh, yeah, that's that's uh, January 27th. 27th. All right. So, hey, happy holidays, guys. Merry Christmas. Bo, 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 bo. Happy holidays. <laughs> I was wondering if you're going to do your big Crosby. <laughs> Crosby set now. Uh, can you do a Minute Maid commercial for us, Dave? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do the 70s Minute Maid commercials. You can use Minute Maid in your holiday baking. <laughs> With your craft cheese. And add it to your apple pie. With craft cheese spread. Like, like, <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. Adding craft cheese will perfect any recipe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, this episode will be archived at comicsgreat.com slash CAG108. If you enjoyed this discussion, if you've been enjoying the show this year, a great present you could give to me is to give the show a star rating on you uh, on itunes however many stars you think it deserves or if you're watching it on youtube giving it a thumbs up helps more people find the show thank you to dave and rain of comicsbakery.com thanks to andros ethelfred on twitter if people want to follow you yeah sure cartoonists if cartoonists want to harangue you about hey buy my book they should follow you on twitter at <laughs> ethelfred right Go ahead. I'll check out your, your segment. <laughs> and thanks to know Ma- your selector. <laughs> know your selector. Uh, and thanks to Matt Dubay and Eric Closer in the control room for stitching this thing together week after week after week. Thanks to the Ann Arbor District Library for letting me do this show uh, on Wednesdays at uh, in their studio here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Until next time, everybody. I have been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. <laughs>